Well, Dr. Antonetti, I want to thank you for joining us. Obviously, we had a conversation the other day for a story that appeared on our website earlier this month about the obesity epidemic across the country, but also particularly here in South Carolina. And I wanted to tell you, I cover a lot of crazy stuff, a lot of frightening stuff. I don't get scared very often, but some of the numbers, the trends, and the costs that you laid out were a little frightening. Well, certainly the numbers are, uh, they are alarming. It's, uh, it's something that's not going away, and it's really a silent epidemic that um, people really aren't talking about and really poorly understand the, the coming tidal wave of effects on our society. Well, let me ask you, before we get into some of those numbers, how do we define this? What are we talking about? What is, what is obesity? How do we measure it? How do we know if we have it? What's the... So typically, obesity is defined by BMI. BMI is just a measure of weight ratio of weight to height. So it lets us compare people of different heights and weights. If you're six feet tall and 300 pounds, it's different than if you're five feet tall and 300 pounds. So ab weight is not the absolute measure. So BMI is defined as um, its mass in kilograms over um, surface area in meters squared. So it just basically produces a round number. So normal BMI is 25, basically. That's the cutoff. Between 25 and 30, you're considered overweight. BMI of 30 to 35 is um, is um, obese, and then over 35, we start getting various categories of morbidly obese patients. So as we look at those numbers here in South Carolina, how do we measure up? Obviously the report from earlier this month that we talked about, not good in terms of our municipalities. How do we as a state stack up though? Typically South Carolina is always in the top 15 states uh, in terms of uh, percentage of population with obesity. Typically we're 32 to 35% of our population is obese. Some of our counties, Allendale County particularly, is 46% is obesity. Uh, across the country though, if you look at all adults, most recent data shows about 42% of U.S. adults are obese. Has it always been this bad? Is this... No, it's, it's getting progressively worse rapidly. Um, changes in our society, um, different types of jobs, different levels of activity have really caused this uh, epidemic to accelerate. So we've, ha we've seen about a doubling in the obesity rate from 1999, 2000 to about to 2022. A doubling? Doubling, In yes. the last? 20 to 25 to 30 years over that time period, depending on which stats you, you use. But yeah, it's about doubled. So, I mean, the, the, it's across all socioeconomic um, platform um, um, strata. It's across all. Um, races, ethnicities, we've seen it as just as a population. And even across the world, it's, it's really a problem. There are more people uh, so with obesity in the world than there are malnourished people in the world, with the exception of some areas in Africa. It's across all societies to various degrees. And one of the things you mentioned the last time we spoke was about how it's filtering down into our children, how the childhood obesity rates are soaring. So if you, if you look at children between the ages of 10 and 17, about 20% of the kids in South Carolina in that age are, are obese, which is really phenomenal. I mean, that's a dramatic increase from what we had seen historically. And those, uh, those children, if your parents are obese, there's a 75% chance that those children are going to be obese. So as the numbers of adults continue to increase, we should expect a, uh, a similar rise in the number of, uh, of kids that are suffering with obesity. So the trend lines are not moving in the right direction. They are moving in the wrong direction, 100%. So let me ask you this. We've got these terrible numbers moving in the wrong direction. What is the cost of that? And again, not just on on the system on a, on, as a society, but how does that impact what we pay for our health care? So obesity um, really has, plays a part in a lot of disease processes. If you look at just some big picture numbers, there's correlations with diabetes, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, changes in liver um, disease, joint disease, reflux. So it impacts a lot of things. Uh, but specifically when we're looking about um, numbers that are really alarming, the cancer risk in obese patients is about 71% higher than in non-obese patients. Obese people have two to three times the likelihood of dying of cardiovascular disease than non-obese people. So mm -hmm. when you start to add up all these things, the, the, the numbers become truly staggering. The estimated cost of obesity in, in 2019 dollars is about $176 billion a year. 
spent with on healthcare for obesity related problems or problems that obesity has, has directly uh, related with. And that number is projected to hit $240 billion here in the next couple of years. So it's accelerating rapidly. So as it's, it's not a linear increase, we're starting to see sort of an exponential increase in those numbers. As more people have obesity and more people live longer, the cost of having those problems is just dramatically increasing. And for each individual in the country, it's, it's about the cost, uh, if you look at between a, a, an obese and a non-obese person, it's about $1,800 a year more in healthcare costs per person if you're, uh, if you're obese as opposed to non-obese. So if we could shed some of these pounds, we could shed potentially billions of dollars a year in, in these spillover costs from these other... Uh, let me ask you this. Given that financial incentive, how do we start to tackle this problem? I know you'd mentioned during our conversation education was important. That's the, the start of it, obviously. What are some methods to combat this that, you know, it, it, starting with what we eat, how we prepare food, obviously, but how sure. do we tackle this as, as a society and as individuals? Well, it's a huge problem, and um, it definitely correlates with um, uh, socioeconomic um, groupings, but there are, there are various opportunities, and certain people have more opportunities than others, but we have, to, we have to start equating or leveling that playing field. We have to start educating all kids early on about nutrition. Um, there are various um, hurdles and obstacles. Obviously, with the, uh, with the explosion of fast food and cheaper food, and it's cheaper, unfortunately, to get a um, fast food meal than it is to actually buy healthy food and prepare a healthy meal. So with some of those hurdles and some of the, uh, the concept of a food desert in a, in a country like ours, the, the idea that there are people who really don't have access to, to healthy food is staggering. Yeah, what is the food desert? Walk us through. So a food means. desert basically is an area where the av availability of healthy or um, more nutritious food is limited. Mm -hmm. So the food options become um, more fast food based or foods that are lower in nutritional value. So there are places within our country and a lot of, a lot of the cities and some of the rural areas where there's just not access in a reasonable distance for most people to get healthier food choices. So this puts increased pressure on um, the choices they make. And unfortunately, the choices that they have and the options that they have do not always uh, correspond to being able to eat uh, the healthiest way possible. So the inability to get healthy meals, the um, lack of understanding about the con long-term consequences of repeated consumption of fast food or unhealthy meals, um, that's, that's where we really have to start. We have to let people know what, what nutrition really is and then what, the, the, what are the consequences <coughs> of um, the choices they make in the short term and long term. A lot of times in the short term there aren't a huge amount of consequences, mm -hmm. but time over time and repeated behaviors definitely lead to the, the place where we are now. So education is the number one thing. You mentioned Allendale. Is that that's a food desert. It, well, there are there are limitations. Yes, there mm -hmm. are certain limitations on what is available. Um, you know, and certainly as we've gone through the pandemic and supply chain issues, and there's climate change issues with what's happening in California and the availability of fruits and vegetables. So, all that impact um, is going to be felt on consumers and people in these areas are the people that are going to feel it the most. Mm -hmm. Talk a little bit about what you do. Obviously, this hospital, the center that you helped found, you address this through surgical uh, approaches. That seems to be, particularly if, if you're an employer dealing with the potential cost, walk us through the cost benefit of that, if you sure. will. Sure. So, unfortunately, um, because obesity is so prevalent, people have look, been looking for ways to combat it for a long time. There have been numerous studies on the benefits of weight loss, even moderate weight loss in the, in the resolution of diabetes, high blood pressure. So people have been searching for um, dietary modifications, behavioral modifications, medically supervised weight loss attempts. There's billions of dollars being spent every year on medications and treatments. But what was found staggeringly, you know, some 40 years ago, was that the best treatment for um, type 2 diabetes was actually surgery. And this was groundbreaking mm -hmm. that 
If you operated on somebody, and, and in particular in that case it was a gastric bypass, you could reverse their diabetes, even in the absence of significant weight loss, relatively quickly. So this led to an entire explosion of, uh, of research in this area. And t multiple studies over long periods of time have found that surgical treatment for um, morbid obesity is actually the best and most durable way to achieve results. And those results would be resolution of comorbidities. So losing weight is, is a mechanism to fixing some of the healthcare issues that go along with the weight. So the absolute amount of weight is not really the issue, it's the, it's the comorbidity resolution, the resolution of problems or the prevention of problems that could potentially happen. So with um, bariatric surgery, with weight loss surgery, the resolution rate of diabetes is phenomenal. I mean, it's, it's off the chart compared to any other therapy. So the most, meta, most mo modalities right now, medications, they treat the diabetes and they do, there are more medications out now that treat diabetes well. But surgery actually fixes the diabetes. It mm -hmm. resolves the biochemical pathways that have gone awry that cause the diabetes. So um, surgery is a great option, but it's, it's dramatically underused mm -hmm. just for a variety of reasons that you can imagine the numbers of people in our country. I mean, there's hundreds of millions of people that are obese or overweight in our country. And we do a million surgeries maybe a year. So we're, we are only touching one, two percent maybe in some areas of the people that could potentially benefit. But the benefits for people that have surgery are reaped in the short and long term. So if you, and we've seen some employers, some more employers that are looking at a more long term strategic approach. If an employer has rapid turnovers of employees, that's not somebody who's gonna invest in their health care. Mm. But employers that are really concerned and that really want to keep their employees and have them be employees for a while have done the math. The return of investment on a, on a bariatric surgery, especially in a, in a um, well-established center, it's about two years. Mm. So after you initially get through that first two years, you've recouped the cost of what you've spent on that surgery because it, it is a significant investment but if you're planning on having an employee work with you for longer than that, that's about the time period. So if you have employees that are overweight and that have diabetes and high blood pressure, the amount of money you're spending on them is recouped within the first 2.2, 2.1 years. So it's good for individual health, societal health, and corporate health, apparently. Yeah, uh, it's just making a decision, and we don't always do that well, making a decision about investing in long term rather than short term. Well, they see the sticker shock, but then don't see the long term benefits. Of, yeah. Yeah. Well, Dr. Antone, first of all, I want to thank you for not only the work you're doing to help turn people's lives around through these surgeries, but more importantly, I think for our audience, letting us know just what we're up against and educating us and our audience about just how serious this problem has become. So I want to thank you again for taking the time. Great. Dr. Antonetti. Thank you for having me. Yes, sir.